All right. Welcome, Mr. Oliver Jones. Hello, <laughs> Joseph Kim. We are here with, at, with Game Makers, and today we are going to be talking about your journey here in India and co-founding Bombay Play. So we're basically going to talk about, and in summary, first, how you came to India and why. Secondly, the gaming industry here in India and being an early employee at kind of two of the biggest gaming companies here in India, Zynga and Moonfrog. And finally, founding Bombay Play and more information about this category, which I think you're calling, is, is it you or is it a, is it a wide uh, it, it's, term? It's more, it's, more, it's more than just me. There are a few others, <laughs> okay, okay. but we're, we're a small a secretive society <laughs> who are trying to pioneer this space. Awesome. Okay, so let's start at the beginning. And so I wanted to start by asking you about, you know, when did you come to India and why? And also, did your gaming journey start from where you came from? And I assume you're, are you Welsh? Yeah, I'm Welsh, yeah. Ah, that's right. Well, well done. Yeah. Well done. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's right. Okay. Uh, Fred and, and Kamrai. <laughs> and, um, and so, like, did it start in, you know, abroad or did, did it start when you came to India? Uh, I mean, it's been a lifelong journey in gaming okay. since uh, a very young age, I think, using early tools such as Game Maker and making the games that I wanted but didn't exist. I think the first game I wanted but didn't exist was Quidditch. You know, I was a big Potterhead. <laughs> and, and so I really wanted to make that game, uh, made it in sort of Game Maker. Turns out J.K. Rowling is a terrible <laughs> game designer because <laughs> the rules don't make sense. <laughs> <laughs> why doesn't everyone follow why doesn't everyone catch the golden snitch you know and uh yeah uh so that's where i started at a, at a very kind of young age just hacking stuff building stuff and then um it throughout sort of uh my undergrad and and postgrad it was always you know focused on games mm -hmm. uh after graduation I, so I graduated um Brunel University London and then uh immediately from there but well, almost immediately i worked for a company called state of play for a small while okay. uh studio that actually won uh, a bafta for its work oh, nice. uh, for point and click adventures okay uh loom and lumino city um and then sort of moved out to india to work for zynga okay. um a very uh very soon after you know the how did that happen did did somebody from Zynga India reach out to you or were you like looking to try and jump into India for some reason? I was looking to jump into Zynga, okay. you know, I, the, like back in 2010, 2011, Zynga was right. like yeah. hot, <laughs> hot, 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 hot. <laughs> and the, as a, they were so disruptive, everyone, all the, all the uh, core gamers hated them, all the social gamers loved them. <laughs> uh, so uh, as a game designer, you know, I was driven by making games that people would play right. didn't really matter whether they for, were for myself or for somebody else yeah and it it just was immediately obvious like the the mission statement of zynga really rang true to me which was you know why you know everyone deserves great games why does it have to be just people like yourself okay um and that resonated uh i applied um i originally thought i was going to join zynga in uh, I think it was Guildford or something okay. at the time, but uh, it turns out the the position was in India. So uh, and then when I got the job offer, it's like, yeah, it's game designer, great. It, it's in India, by the way. Uh, <laughs> but as somebody young and foolish, I you know I immediately broke up with my girlfriend and left. <laughs> 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 and that uh, that's how I came to India. Okay. Yeah. And then, what was that? So when you first landed here and started in Zynga. Mm. What what was that experience like? How did you adjust to life here? Well, I, I landed in Bangalore with like um, about three hundred dollars of traveler's checks. That was the <laughs> whole. That's everything to my name and a Nintendo Wii in my backpack. <laughs> wow. Uh, yeah, but had a job at Zynga, so that was something. And how big was Zynga India at that time when you joined? Uh, it, I think it was less than hundred, maybe around hundred. Okay. okay, you could say. So I, still very early. Yeah. Yeah. Um, worked on a game called Yeovil, which was one of the OG. Ah, oh, yeah, uh, Robert Lai. Yeah, <laughs> uh, 
and that game still runs today. <laughs> Wait, uh, didn't didn't they buy it back or didn't they? Yeah, they bought I think the community bought it. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure what the fate is today, but it's alive. Okay, great. Um and I actually love that game. It's just the epitome of I guess hypersocial, which is the thing that okay. uh, we're trying to sort of reinvigorate okay. uh, in, in 2022. Um, and then uh, the reason why I came out was because India was known for this place that had like not a great amount of, at, at least at that time, not a great amount of design talent. So okay. that's why they kind of imported random Welsh dudes from <laughs> London, apparently, <Right. laughs> to sort of elite, like uh, spearhead the cause. And as such, sort of being at the right place, right time, right. ended up leading a bunch of, you know, multi-million dollar Zynga games that were at the, at the time being brought from, you know, the US over to India. Right. Yeah. So what was that like in terms of, like, if you were to characterize the game industry in India at that time, and maybe how it's progressed to today. Like, well, are there any major changes in terms of how the free-to-play game industry has developed? Uh, and more specific to India in terms of like whether it's like the specialization, because, you know, obviously it kind of started off mainly live ops oriented and, and that kind of thing. But maybe you can characterize how it was then versus, versus now. I, I think it was, even back then, we didn't know how to run live ops. Okay. You know, we needed a lot of help and thankfully you know there were uh leaders in zynga india uh who had a lot of trust from right. you know pinkers um and were sort of left to their uh, you know a lot of trust to, to run these games independently and there were a whole lot of mistakes games went down <laughs> bad releases went out um it, it, we would be on our laptops um, you know, the, the grind was real, like it's keeping those games alive and keeping the reputation right. of that team going, yeah. um, was a hard slog. Uh, I wouldn't say that we entirely mastered the art of live ops, but what, what we learned really was we learned live ops the Zynga way, okay. which was driving revenue every week. <laughs> like, what are you doing? What is the feature this week that will give you that extra five, ten percent that you can show in your product review next right. week? That's the that was the frequency of releases we were doing, and that's the pace we learned to run at. Um, what that meant was that we didn't really have much time to think of the long term. Um, we did start building out bold beats right. uh but i've like i feel that that's where our inexperience started to show okay like when when you start trying to build these uh you know it well trying to innovate uh in a live ops scenario um and you you misread your audience i mean your audience is halfway around the world right. how are you supposed to know what they like what they you know we didn't really have the player council set up properly uh, they, I mean, Zynga today obviously has sorted out a lot of these problems, but back then it was very raw and we just did what we thought was best and ended up spending a whole lot of time on features that went nowhere um, or releasing very janky features. So some of our best successes were actually like sales pop-ups that the, where the exit button wasn't working for some reason okay. and, you know, uh, things like this. So, but um, where where we are today though... I think we have more people with actual building, like from scratch experience. Okay. And they know what it takes to build a higher quality product from the very beginning. And, the, you know, it's not a really a culture anymore of trying to get those quick wins. Mm -hmm. um, even though, like, uh, I'd say at the beginning of Moonfrog, quick wins was really <laughs> was really our strategy because uh, we ran out. We were running out of money quite fast, so we yeah. you know we ended up quote unquote fast following a bunch of things. Okay. Um, but uh, these days, you have more mature teams yeah. who are dedicating the time and the patience required to build a good quality product. Now that being said. Uh, still way behind, I think, where we need to be. Okay. Um, but thankfully, we have people like maybe you and your team and Bombay Play, like yeah. tr trying to spearhead the effort. <laughs> um, and the people with the time, money, 
and patience to to you know develop world class right. games from India. And not to linger too much on the past, but certainly Zynga had a pretty profound impact on the Indian game development ecosystem. Right uh, from Zynga, a bunch of people left and started companies like Moonfrog and Bombay Play, which you were a part of both of those, as well as a number of other gaming companies here. And Moonfrog is also one of the success stories here in India. In you having been at both of those companies, could you talk about maybe a little bit how those companies were as far as like, if you were to compare or contrast culture, maybe if you could talk about some of the things that they did well. Okay. So the reason for these companies sort of splintering out from Zynga was really uh, a matter of that we just grew enough comfort we grew like enough confidence inside of zynga and we didn't see we didn't see that there was anything that they were doing that we could not do ourselves right. you know um i'm sure we've we've all been in that situation where your boss is kind of halfway around the world and telling you you can't do things and sooner or later <laughs> you get disgruntled <laughs> and uh and i've been in that situation several times like i work for glue mobile as well here okay. in in uh in hyderabad actually okay um but um it, it was a matter of just getting the confidence and uh, taking the plunge i think the speed i think back in the day i'm not sure if it's still a mantra of zynga but it's zynga speed that was the uh uh that was the saying and we really live by it like product reviews every week is no joke right. that's a lot of overhead that's a lot of work right uh, you'd have typically one or two product managers just doing the reviews right. um and just presenting the work that was done yeah. um and carry what that really helps is give you an entrepreneurial mindset to gaming and mm -hmm. uh you, you know what the best practice you know what like what the best in class are doing and what you need to do to get there right so when we started of course product reviews every week isn't practical for a starter, especially when you have no product out there but setting that sort of cadence right. um get having something to show play testing frequently uh, pushing, pushing to sort of arrive at a conclusion, a new direction, um, every single week or every uh, biweekly really allows you to move fast. And I think you see that DNA in a lot of companies right. here. So, um, <laughs> it's why you also see people trying to more hyper casual developers maybe exist in India because of this reason, right. uh, because we've sort of kind of been trained to be hackers and trained to sort of, uh, keep experimenting as if it were sort of a live op setup, you right. could say, uh, where we, instead of releasing new features on a live ops game, we're releasing new games all the time right. and the sort of through scientific process, figuring out what works and what doesn't. Scientific process, I'd say, is the second thing. Um, it's uh, we did not we miss we learned to uh, mistrust our own instincts okay. and listen to the market. Um, in fact, to say that you have strong conviction about something was often frowned upon. <laughs> like, how can you have conviction? <laughs> yeah, you need something more than conviction yeah. here. Yeah. Um, so we we really learned to follow the data. Okay. And so when it came to launching new games, uh, I think the, just the ruthlessness and uh, of sort of seeing how that game is doing right. from a retention and monetization point of view and arriving at a quick conclusion. Um, and I think you, those of us from Zynga who started our companies, that's the culture you will kind of see very results driven, very scientific um and sort of hyper aggressive and in our pace so i guess all of these things combined we just want to sort of tell the world we're making games in india and we're coming for you you know <laughs> <laughs> we're learning faster damn it right uh, we're also failing a lot but we're learning faster and sooner or later we're inevitable yeah so speaking more about the india specific market if you were to kind of characterize what's good and what and you kind of touched upon some of the advantage of the Indian gaming market, but like where, where do you see left to go? What should the Indian gaming ecosystem or the, the developers here, what do they need to learn to improve, to become more successful? Um, 
Uh, that's a that's an interesting question, and I wouldn't necessarily uh, make a blanket statement for everyone because there's sure. like yeah, it's situational. In, in India is such a big place. Okay, it's you have as many cultures in India as you do in Europe. Okay, um, and I think when you look at gaming companies as well, there is just people operating in all manner of ways. Right, uh, you do have a few teams who are trying to build huge projects that may never see the light of day. <laughs> um, and you do have uh, many teams who are thinking very short term, right. pay, like almost paycheck to paycheck in the services industry, right. for example. Yep. Um, I do. I do wish that the, especially those who are starting this, you know, service based companies who are doing really great sort of work for international, well, international gaming companies. Uh, in fact, a lot of even AAA games get a lot of their services done through service providers in India. Right. Um, I mean, here in Bangalore, you have sort of the rock star folks yep. Yep. who are working on big, you know, really big, uh, scale games and they have uh, they have developers they have artists they have uh technical artists they've got the whole shebang pretty much other than the design right. um op operating out of it they may even have to design i'm not 100 percent, but um i do wish that the service orientated uh studios do go out do figure out a way to work on their own ip and get out of the service driven model into a recurring sort of gaming studio driven model. I think that would drive a lot more innovation. Got it. Um, although services is a great, it, it's great for jobs. It's great for stability. Um, but it's not so great for innovation, which is yeah. homegrown. Um, I guess that's what I hope generally India becomes more, well, what we see more from India in future. So maybe now we can shift to Bombay Play. So you recently, well, maybe we could just start from the beginning. Like, why did you start the company? What did you see in it? And um, I know you recently raised some capital as well. So maybe you could talk us through the, yeah. the current history and trajectory of the company. Yeah. So uh, Bombay Play, so I guess uh, Moonfrog, I was also a co-founder there. Yep. And, uh, you know, that company went through Seed and Series A. Uh, but I felt like I always had this ambition of building games in India for the world. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's really where the idea of sort of Bombay play germinated. Um, now Bombay play was started just over three years ago. We've again done seed in series A. Uh, so it's been a one hell of a ride. Um, okay. the objective of Bombay play well, also the objective of Moonfrog in some way, it's to address uh, address the red ocean problem in gaming. Mm -hmm. uh, even back in 2015, when we started Moonfrog, we felt like we couldn't compete because there were so many games in all, in like pretty much every category, um, so many great games in, in each category. And we, we were seeing that marketing channels were getting expensive. So... Back then, we decided to look at the Indian audience and cater, you know, content for them. It was an underserved audience, and that worked. Uh, what Bombay Play is trying to do is take some of the lessons that we that that were learned through developing for India to the world, and that's this idea of making games that focus on network effects. Okay, and. That's the uh, that's the, what we're calling the genre of hypersocial. Okay. Um, which is just games that focus on network effects, games that are be built less like ice cream, which is a great single player experience, and more like pizza, which okay. is best shared with friends. Um, so it's a you could say it's more of a product strategy. Right. Um, I think every gaming company, every gaming company says that they'll leverage network effects, and it's important for every company's success. But when you start asking people how exactly are they pushing network effects, there's right. often no answer. Right. Like it's this ethereal like right. uh, concept that well, with scale, we'll get more people to play. Um, and I, what we've seen is that not many people have really thought through how to design their content 
for, uh, I guess, how does your content become like a social network? Right. Um, so can you give yeah. us an example of how you do that at Bombay Play or for one in one of your games? Sure. So this is, first of all, you need to pick a genre which is sort of intuitive to play with other people. Okay. Like social isn't something that you should slap on top, right? It has to be there from the from the very core. Right. So um, one of our first games, uh, it's called Card Party. It's a card game. Um, this is, uh, it's intuitive that you would sort of invite people to play a card game with you. And during the peak of the sort of pandemic, this was a big hit for us. Um, and a lot of the people would play like, oh, I love this game because I can play with my kids, play with my, um, uh, you know, play with my grandparents, whoever, play with my friends. Uh, it was the kind of game that is, the experience is enhanced, you know, um, through, uh, through invites. Uh, secondly, we build our games on HTML5 first. Okay. So sharing a game, like sharing any one of Bombay Plays games, is as simple as copy and pasting a link. Okay. So if I'm playing a card game, I can just share that link with my friend on WhatsApp or whatever. Right. Um, and they can just click on that and jump into my game, be in the same context as me, right. and play right now. So for you, your games are not mobile apps. They're HTML five games. So if I'm playing on the phone, you're playing in browser. Is that? Yeah, correct. Okay. Um, that's how we start. And that's how we build what we call our atomic networks. Like okay. uh, we, uh, our main objective is to get to a point where there is a small community in your game that really sticks. Okay. If you have a bad game, that's never going to happen, right? Uh, the content is king after all. Uh, so no matter whether you develop it on H5 or make it inherently social, uh, it doesn't, you know, content, if it's not good, then people won't play, okay. right? So it's really, so what we're calling hypersocial today is, yeah, games that are designed to be better with your friends or you can av advance further with them or the fun is enhanced and they're much easier to share um, and by leveraging whatever technologies we can find. So that's also why we've been doing a lot of experiments on social networks like Facebook, right. uh, because it really, um, you know, if, if a social game exists on a social network, it kind of makes, it, it removes the barriers to access it. So how, how is Facebook gaming or instant gaming doing? Because I remember there was a period when people thought that would be the next big thing. I know I've worked on a number of projects on instant gaming and like the retention was just trash. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I did, it was just so hard. To... Yeah. I guess what do you regret more? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, but uh, yeah, so instant gaming these days, I would categorize it as a very advanced ad. Mm, okay. Right. Um, it's an ad which monetizes itself and it allows you to cross-promote your most engaged users to your apps. Okay. Yeah. Um, it, it's an ad that sort of also re-engages people for free. Okay. So, yeah, we, we try and build these games on instant kind of first, test them out, okay. uh, see if they have that core audience, and then if the basic number, like, yeah, the day one is trash, but if you are able to retain people beyond day one, sort of what is your return rate up until day 30 and you know what does that look like then you can tell whether you, your game really has a product market fit or not okay yeah. so if you're launching on instant first and then the game is playable anywhere so you know web browser mobile phones uh, mobile phone browser things like that how do you get distribution or how do you you've created a game then how do you market it from there sure so there are the traditional methods okay. uh, that I think everyone's using, you can just market it like normal. Um, to to a web URL? Is yeah, to okay. a web URL. I mean, okay. that's not nothing new to yeah, yeah. promote a website sure. versus a, yep. you know. Um, uh, but also there's cross-promotion um, from Facebook Instant, okay. which is also very effective. Um, it, it's like you can just, uh, you can... Uh, the great thing about H5 is that you can acquire users at like a tenth of the cost. Mm -hmm. There's no install, right? Okay. The day one is low, so there is a balancing act you need to figure out. But um, the, you can really 
it, it's literally cents you can acquire users for. Okay. Um, and it's also, you know, it, it's a channel which isn't as saturated as like app store marketing. Okay. And is it easy right. to monetize based upon these kind of, kind of games or is it more ad based advertising? Yeah. It's super tough. It's super okay. tough to monetize. And, um, but really what you're looking at is like, what is your cross promotion LTV? And that's how you, uh, that, that's how you turn out positive at the end of the day. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Is there anyone working on a solution for like HTML5 IAP monetization? Is there something out there or is it? You can use whatever you want, really. That's yeah. the beauty of it. Like yeah. it's a, if it's a web page, then what right, do you, right, whatever right. you want, yeah. like direct bank transfer, baby. <laughs> <But> like... <laughs> <laughs> Let's go. Sure. What app store fee? Okay. Yeah. And, and so the, I guess now that you've been doing this for, for three years, you raised some capital, mm. um, and so what's the plan to continue to build out these games? What, what's the kind of longer term strategy for Bombay Play? Um, it's really to make games the next social network. Okay. We think like a lot of games today, um, well, let's talk about the ultimate goal is to disrupt casual gaming as we know it. Okay. Um, casual gaming, it does have some very social experiences there, but we, from what we've seen of the market, the vast majority of games are still very much single player and or what we call low social um wherein sort of you install the game and you have to play for a long while before you get to the multiplayer bit right. and then maybe you can invite your friend who also has to download the game play to where you are yeah. and then you can match make um they we think there's uh, this space is sort of ripe for disruption um especially like maybe the simpler games that, uh, you know, lots of people who don't even consider themselves gamers play, who have, have zero social features whatsoever. So that's kind of the low hanging fruit we're going for first. Okay. Yeah. And is, is TikTok a, a channel for you guys? Cause I, I remember hearing about an HTML5 game blowing up and it kind of got blew up because of some, some TikTok or something like that. But... Uh, TikTok is an interesting channel, but yeah. what, and so is Snapchat, to be honest. Right. These are all instant sure. platforms. But uh, I think we're skeptical, to be honest. <laughs> okay. uh, TikTok is sort of inevitable, we, we think, because you know, uh, if you have a big user base right. and then games on that platform right. and then you already have monetization sort of figured out, it right. should work. But w as a game developer, you have to sort of think, well, stop and think, how much does the company that owns this content really prioritize gaming? Sure. Yeah, right. I wasn't. I wasn't speaking more as a gaming platform, but like mm. some TikTok video of a HTML5 game kind of blew up, and then that led to a lot of right. And there's uh, been some great examples of this, by the way, right. like Wordle. Okay, that's a browser game, right? Oh, okay. And it, that's and okay. we're all together. We're all trying to solve one puzzle. It's a social experience. Right. Right, but that that game didn't really have a, I guess, a social network around it. Sure. So you can really think you know, like you you can really describe Wordle as a low social game that people socialize over Twitter or like right. somehow made that those connections and WhatsApp groups and these own the, their own insular groups. But uh, a hyper social game would really build a community within the game itself. Okay. Or maybe even allow people to make their own puzzles and share it with their friends to solve. Right. You know, like design, the design of the game at the core has to be I social. See. Right. Got it. Okay. Um, and maybe one other question I can ask you is what's, what's your outlook for Indian gaming development? Like what, how, how do you think about India and the future of gaming here? I, I, yeah, I would, <laughs> I would categorize it as inevitable. Okay. It's inevitable. Like, uh, with the population, what it is surpassing China. <laughs> Right. Like yeah. why? And the amount of investment that flows into India, Bangalore, right. particularly highest GDP growth country. Exactly. Like uh, India just has and GDP growth is no joke. As soon as when a company is growing at the speed of India, it takes a lot to slow it down. Right. Uh, it, even like the ec, the large sort of macroeconomic situation where we both find ourselves in today, yeah. India is it just grows its way out of it. Okay. Um, sure, there are in in C. Um, you're seeing a lot of uh, company. Well, a lot. Sorry, I call them. Or a lot of countries actually get swallowed up 
by debt uh, and uh, by, I, I guess, instability. Okay. But India is not in that category. Um, it's it's just it has such a strong economic machine that it's uh, it's relatively stable in this sort of part of the world. And it's also a great sort of balance between East and West, I find. Uh, like a large English speaking op uh, like population, but also like the culture is kind of East leaning at the same time. Right. Um, it's like, a, it's well situated to sort of perform well. And it already has in many, uh, many industries and a lot of sort of Silicon Valley, <laughs> Silicon Valley CEOs are yeah. Indian. And, Absolutely. you know, imagine if that talent <laughs> stayed in <laughs> India, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, imagine how many great companies would right. come out. Okay. And I think that's starting to happen. Um, the, the opportunities, especially in the startup world, are right. just becoming so, well, the, the, the outcomes become so much greater that it really does become a, a more of a, a, a less of a no brainer to move out to sort of Europe and US. Yeah. Silicon Valley yeah. is not, not the same. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So actually, let me ask you one, one final question then. Um, since we're here, we're in India, there's a lot of entrepreneurs uh, in India, in Bangalore, a lot of people who want to start the game studios. What advice would you give for them to kind of follow the path like you have co-founding Moonfrog and Bombay Play now? Um, um, I, I think uh, foolishness really helps. <laughs> <laughs> Don't overthink it. Um, and there's no real right time. Mm -hmm. You just need to be in the market when the opportunity to uh, execute comes up. Right. So it, there's uh, some. So you don't need to immediately start a company with a great idea. Is my personal okay. sort of approach. You need to have a gaming company already with a team <laughs> able to execute. So when the opportunity, when you see the opportunity come up finally, you're able to jump on it. Right. Um, so yeah, I guess, uh, it, it's that, it's that famous saying like, uh, you know, a great idea has to find you working. Right. <laughs> so if you're locked inside some big MNC style company and you have a great game idea and you're not able to execute, well, there's not much you could do about that. But if you're in the fields, there's a lot you can do. So get into the arena. Yeah. So get into the arena. <laughs> um, and don't, I think, don't worry about your salary, <laughs> I guess, for the first few years. Uh, it's not going to be the same, but, uh, you know, you, it, especially, I think we're talking about India specifically. Yeah. So you, like living in Bangalore is a little bit more expensive, but you can make your own games. You can start your own team on a very low budget, right? right? If you lower your standard of living <laughs> for a while, you can start on, on nothing. Like Moonfrog started with, I think the equivalent of, I think I'd, I would say ballpark $60,000. Wow. That was the whole budget <laughs> like when we started. <laughs> it was just like to, well, 10 lakhs each. Yeah, that's what we put in. <laughs> and that was it. Um, and we were able to build a company that exited for a hundred million, yeah. you know? Um, it, it, people think that they need a lot of capital to start, but it's not, that's not entirely true either. You can start with a core team like Bombay Play. We also just started with three guys. Okay. Uh, just working away. Card Party was, came out of that team of three. Okay. Um, and, to, and from then on, we decided to raise money, et cetera. Like, I think the budget for starting Bombay Play was probably even lesser than it was for uh, for Moonfrog. So yeah, it, you really don't need a lot. You just need the knowledge, I guess. So um, and from that, I think there's a great community out here, yeah. uh, especially in Bangalore. I will say that's absolutely the case. The Bangalore game community is very, very friendly, very welcoming. Yeah, and so. Uh, yeah, if anyone's listening to us who wants to join, <laughs> so I, uh, link in the description. <laughs> uh, uh, come, come say hi. We meet up every month and yeah. Sounds good. All right, guys, there you have it. We are here with Mr. Oliver Jones and uh, we'll catch you next time. Thanks, everybody. Bye.